All right, we're going to talk about public policy making. And before this video, I'd like you to watch those short little videos. One's a TED Talk. One's a cute little marshmallow test uh, video. Another one is about uh, happiness, public policy and happiness. Uh, so watch, watch those videos and then watch this. Uh, I know it's a lot to throw you at the last, at the last uh, week of the semester, uh, but there's so much I want to talk about. And I think in the end, public policy making might be the most important topic. And I wish we had enough time to talk about foreign policy, uh, but the extra credit assignment is related to foreign policy. Uh, but really, in the end, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, conservative, liberal, we care about outcomes. We care about solving problems, right? The coronavirus or some national security threat like Iran or North Korea or opioid addiction, whatever. Um, we might have different ways to approach those problems, but we can't, most of us care about those problems. We might have different priorities, right? Maybe you consider the opioid problem more important than the Iran problem, right? Um, or vice versa, but we care about getting things done. And it's not easy to solve problems. If it was, all of our lives would be perfect, right? I'm sure you have some problems. I have some problems, right? Um, and, and so if problems were easy to solve, right, then the world would be perfect. They're not. They're not easy to solve, right? Your book talks about different types of policies, economic policy. We care about economic policy, and they talk about two types of economic policy, fiscal policy, which is taxing, spending, borrowing, right? And, and Congress uh, and the president, uh, through approving the budget, is able to change these taxes and spending. Although what we find is that taxing and spending don't dramatically change year to year, right? Um, then there's monetary policy, which is really... Um, really only, only influenced by one particular government agency. It's an unelected government agency, the Federal Reserve, right? These um, members of the Federal Reserve Board um, are nominated by the president, but of course, right, through the advice and consent, right, they are approved by the U.S. Senate. And these are basically a bunch of really smart bankers, right, that represent the banking industry. And they care about interest rates, stable interest rates, right? And they will, using a variety of tools, which influence banks, making banks buy or sell treasury bonds or making them hold on to more money or less money, right? They change the money supply. Is there more money out there easy to borrow, to, to buy a car, to go to college, to buy a home? Or is there less money out there, less credit out there, right? Interest rates are higher, which means that it's harder to get a loan or you're going to pay more. And they, they fluctuate these interest rates to keep a check on inflation, right? And I, I really wish we could spend more time on monetary policy, the Federal Reserve, this unelected, very powerful body, um, and the tools that they use to control inflation and why that's important. We can't, we can't, right? Um, what, I, what I think I might do is just, just for, you know, if you're interested in economic policy, there's a great little chapter that I have on economic policy. I'll throw that up on the homepage just in case you're curious about it. It's really easy read. Uh, but I wish we had more time because I love monetary policy. It's fascinating, uh, fascinating history from the debate that we shouldn't have paper money, we should only have gold and silver coins, right? That that should be the only currency. To moving to paper, to moving to credit and interest rates and a more complicated monetary system. I, I, it's one of my favorite topics, even though I'm not an economist and I'm far from an expert, I really wish we could spend more time. And chapter 18, foreign policy, um, I just, I completely revamped this this class for good or bad, um, making fewer writing assignments but more small little quizzes. Maybe you hate it. Maybe you hate that. Um, but I I cut the foreign policy chapter. Fascinating chapter. Take a look at it, especially for the extra credit assignment. And of course, there's social policy, right? Policies that deal with 
um, health and criminal justice and other uh, education policies. And a lot of these may be um, related to economic policy. If you invest in human capital and education, you generally stimulate economic growth, right? So the, all of these things are kind of somewhat related, and your book talks about these in a, in a pretty good job. It's a short chapter, and they try to cover a lot. It goes in a lot of different directions. Um, it's hard to cover uh, in one chapter something that it's its entire subfield, right? People get a PhD in political science, and the subfield that they st study is public policy, and we're going to spend one lecture on it. Fiscal policy is the idea of, right, taxing and spending. And we spend money, a lot of money, on Social Security and Medicare, right? Um, we have a sizable defense budget, right? And we also, because we have a very large national debt, we pay 6% of our annual budget just to pay the interest on our national debt, right? And if you compare the sizes of these amounts, they don't change dramatically. Every year we end up spending more and more money, partly because of inflation. Uh, things cost more. If we need to buy tanks, tanks get more expensive and computers get more expensive. Wages become more expensive. So you're going to spend more. The amount of money goes up, but the proportions don't change that much. The defense budget generally hovers between, you know, what I've seen is like uh, over, over the decades, right? You know, I've seen between 14 and 18%. Right. So it doesn't change dramatically. Right. We 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 have a lot of responsibilities when it comes to um, national security around the world, whether it's NATO, whether it's um, uh, South Korea. Um, and so we 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 maintain those obligations from year to year. Right. Year after year, we also bring in less money than we spend, because, again, how do you get elected? You tell people. I'm going to support, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to support all the things you love. You love the military, right? Because you love America. You're a patriot. You love the military, so we're going to spend more money uh, on the military. And you love kids, right? You love kids, right? So we're going to spend more money on education. And you're scared of the coronavirus, so we're going to spend more money on research and development for that. And so uh, to get elected, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to spend money on the things that you really care about criminal justice you think you know crime's a problem all right we're gonna lock people up all right we're, and we're gonna put more police on the street we're like yeah thank you thank you and you know what i'm gonna do on top of that <clears throat> i'm gonna cut your taxes right and you, you applaud go, oh my god dr fernandez i am going to elect you president now because <clears throat> we because um, we like people who say that right um those are very popular ideas <clears throat> spending, excuse me, spending money on the things that we care about, national parks, but cutting our taxes, right? Very popular. Congress knows that and it gives us what we want and we bring in less revenue than we spend. And uh, what, what are the sources of our revenue? Well, we have payroll taxes, income taxes, corporate taxes, right? And we're going to need to bring in more revenue, raise taxes, if we want to spend more money on the things that we care about, like the military, national security, what have you, right? And again, most of us in survey research, we want to spend more on something, environmental protection, health care, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, right? So someone out there in this class wants to increase spending on something. Maybe you have a family member who has cancer. You would like more, more money and research uh, on cancer cures, right? Let's take a look at Nevada. Where do we spend our money? Because states, their obligation is education, they spend a lot of money on education. If you look at the federal budget and the percent spent on education from the federal budget, it's only 3%. And you might say, wow, what, what's, what's on? The federal government doesn't care about education. We live in a federalist system. And there are certain things like criminal justice, right, and education that tend to be taken up mostly by the states, right? So we have education, but we also have health human services. We have higher education, Department of Corrections, right? And so... When you look at state budgets, they do look different than the federal budget because they have different obligations, right? Where do we get our revenue? 
uh, here in Nevada, sales tax, you and I buying things, right? And that video about Nevada revenue, that was done in 2019 about the budget for the next two, year, two years being made in 2019. And the projections, right, were that the economy is going to be pretty good for the next couple of years through 2001. So sales tax revenues are going to go up. Gaming taxes are going to go up a little bit. Clearly, with the crisis that we're dealing with right now with COVID-19, those projections are completely inaccurate, which is one of the reasons why a biennium, creating a budget for two years, is not necessarily the greatest idea. And having a legislature that comes in every year to make projections, adjust projections, and make an annual budget is typically what most states do, but we don't do that. We don't do that. And so these are the sort of estimated uh, revenues. And generally, they're based on good estimations from the past, right? But every now and then, the Great Recession in 2009, 2010, and now 10 years later, the COVID-19 changes those projections dramatically, right? And uh, these were 2017-19 biennium, biennium, and here's the 2019 2021 um, projections. They're not that different, right? They're, they're basically uh, some similarities. When we look at uh, increases in spending, right, we are, our current budget that we're, we're sort of dealing with right now was based on better projected revenues. So our legislators and our governors increased spending on health, on education, on infrastructure, on pretty much everything, right? Um, based on the projections that we we're going to have more income in the next two years, that's problematic. That's problematic. And, and we know that we're not going to have the same revenue, but we budgeted out there for more money. And so that's one of the reasons why a, a two-year budget can run into some problems, right? Because in a two-year period, problems can arise. Let's go back to the federal uh, sources of revenue. Most of it's individual income taxes and a lot of payroll taxes. So those taxes are taxed. You got FICA, you got Social Security taxes um, that go to the federal government and your federal income tax taken out of your paycheck that goes to the federal government. Every year, pretty much, there are fewer and fewer uh, percentage um, coming from corporate taxes. And a lot of liberals and Democrats complain about that. Um, but Donald Trump had made the argument that the United States corporate taxes for a number of decades were higher than European corporate taxes. And he was right. Uh, um, I disagree with Donald Trump on a lot of things, but he said we really need to, to be competitive internationally. We needed to lower corporate taxes. I rarely agree with Donald Trump, but he's absolutely right. And as a bleeding heart liberal, you know that I'm a bleeding heart liberal. <clears throat> I don't think taxing corporations is a good idea because when you tax a corporation, that corporation can do a lot of different things to make up for those taxes. Lower wages for workers, increase the price of a good, right? Um, they can reduce uh, investments in infrastructure, what have you. So really, if you're a bleeding heart liberal like me, what you want to do is you want to tax the rich. And so you want to raise income taxes on a certain tax bracket, right? Or what you can do is raise uh, taxes on inheritance taxes for people who might be multimillionaires and they're leaving money, they pass away, they're leaving money to the kids. You tax that inheritance tax, right? Just maybe just for the wealthy. Or you tax capital gains, which is if you if you bought you know Amazon stock you know ten years ago and it just made a ton of money and you sell it you can tax the capital gains at a slightly higher rate you bring in more revenue and and you're going to be taxing people that are bringing in more wealth individually so really I agree with Donald Trump we we would disagree on maybe taxing the wealthy right he would say no 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 the the, the wealthy are are already being taxed too much. We shouldn't do that. And he has a point. He has a point. Here's some old data. Um, the top 1%, the wealthiest 1%, they basically pay 40% of the federal income taxes, right? 
That's the 1%. The poorest half of the population, the bottom 50%, pay about 3% of federal income taxes. It's because people who make very little money, they either don't have to pay any federal income taxes. The federal income taxes that they do pay in, they get most of it back at the end of the year when they file taxes, or they even get earned income tax credit. They get money back, even more back from the federal government. So really, half the, half the, ta- half the workforce really doesn't pay hardly any federal income taxes. It's the top 1% that are paying a lot of it. That's funding all the things that we care about. So if you ever see a billionaire out there, a millionaire, you know, say thanks. Thanks for paying the taxes. Now, as a bleeding heart liberal, could could they could they pay more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The wealthy are not suffering, right? But they do pay a big share. We should be aware of that when before we go and say let's let's tax the rich, let's tax the rich. Now again, I I think the ta- the rich can pay more, but we have to we we need to collect the data. And I think Trump has an argument. I might not agree with it, but I think he has an, uh, 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 an argument. Here's some more recent data from 2016, um, where you look at, it basically matches 2014 data, uh, data. Here, the rich, because of some tax cuts, are paying a little bit less share of the federal income tax, but still 37%. And we do have to note that the top 1%, they account for about 20% of all the wealth, right? So they're 20 times, right, wealthier than pretty much anyone else, right? And of course, when it comes to the poorest people, they're a thousand times wealthier than those individuals, right? But they really, when you add up all the wealth, right, in a income wealth, not property, because if we, if we looked at property and cars and yachts, they're going to even own more of the wealth, but just income wealth, yearly income wealth, right? They account for 20% of it. So they account for a lot of it, but they're accounting for 37% of the federal, federal income taxes, right? Now, now this top 1%, who are they? It fluctuates year to year and it fluctuates state, state by state. Um, if you made um, close to $500,000, you're in... Um, adjusted gross income, that's after certain deductions and stuff, right? Um, you would be in the top 1%. But but if you take the average of the top 1%, they're millionaires, right? On average, right? If you look at Nevada, right? You can be in the top 1% if you make your adjusted gross income after certain deductions. You make $350,000, you're in the top 1%, right? Which is the 22nd lowest of all the, of the states. But the average income of the top 1% here in Nevada is almost $1.6 million. And I think that has to do with maybe Sheldon Adelson being one of the wealthiest uh, people in the world, living in Nevada, and a few of Steve Wynn and some other people. Right. But, but, the, but the median income is only $27,000, right? So there's a big disparity. And so we are taxing the top 1% at a much higher rate. But a, a lot of liberals, a lot of Democrats would argue that we could tax them more and they would still have a very, very, very good lifestyle, right? Now, again, these are things that are debatable. One, one thing I would show to argue my side that the wealthy, and, and really all of us, I, I could pay more taxes. I really could. Uh, I have a pretty good lifestyle, even though I'm far from, from wealthy. I think I make... Seventy-six thousand uh, dollars. Not that's not including benefits uh, or retirement benefits. Uh, Seventy-six thousand dollars a year. It's not a ton of money, but it's more than enough for my very simple lifestyle, right? Um, I I don't I, I often take the bus to work. Not not anymore. Um, and my wife and I we only have one car, and we you know we we try to limit our expenses. I feel I could pay more taxes to offset some of the problems that we're dealing with uh, in this nation. And compared, compared to most other nations, when we look at total tax revenue as a percentage of the size of a nation's economy, we are near the bottom of industrialized Western democracies, right? So our tax burden is really not that high relative to other countries, right? Now, you may argue, well, those countries are... 
just taxing even way too much, right? That the United States is taxing too much and these other countries are even worse, right? A liberal would say, look, these countries have a good lifestyle uh, and their economies are doing well. Okay, they were doing well in 2019. Um and they even tax their, their wealthy even more than we do, right? And they're still doing well, right? Um, so the argument is that we would have room to tax more. But again, we, we need to look at the data so that we don't get carried away and say, yeah, we can tax the rich in an unlimited fashion. That's clearly not, not correct. We need to do something. We need to control spending. And we need to bring in more revenue, right? And the classic Keynesian economics is that when times are good, you cut spending, even on the things you love, right? Food stamps, welfare, you know, uh, unemployment benefits, military. When, when times are good, you cut spending and you raise taxes because everyone's employed, wages are going up, Let, let's, let's pay down the, the debt. When times are bad, that's when you increase spending, like we're doing right now in COVID-19, right? And you cut taxes, right? Usually there's more good times than bad, but every now and then you get a recession, right? Like in the gray areas here, and you have to increase spending to put people back to work and cut taxes because people can't afford the taxes. You make up for it by raising taxes and cutting spending when times get better. We just don't do that. We just don't do that. We always cut taxes and raise spending in bad times, but we almost never cut spending and raise taxes um, when times are good because it's not politically popular, right? But sometimes we need leaders that are going to do things that are not popular, right? And raising taxes and cutting spending doesn't feel good at that moment. And you and I are like the marshmallow kid. We want to feel good now, right? We don't care about the future, right? And the problem is that our national debt is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day, right? And this is already almost a month old, right? Since last time I took a screenshot, right? Our economy keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's great. Part of it is because you and I become more productive. Our population grows. We just get better at making things. Um, because you have the internet and you have a word processor and you have a computer. I didn't have a computer when I was in college. No one had ever heard of the internet when I was in college and we had to use the card catalog. You literally could probably write 10 papers in the time it would take me to write one paper when I was in college. We're just more productive. We're just better, right? And our economy gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger right? But our national debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we have not seen our national debt get larger than our overall economy, our overall GDP, since World War II, when we were fighting a world war, right? We were able to pay down that national debt after World War II. You know why? We were really the only manufacturing base in the world after World War II. England, Germany, Japan, all of Europe was just decimated, decimated, right, after World War II. Other than Pearl Harbor, our nation was, our, our land, our, our infrastructure, our manufacturing base was completely untouched by World War II. Not the case for England and Germany and Japan. So we were the only game in town. And when people bought cars or manufacturing goods, guess what they bought? They bought American, right? And we were able to pay down that debt, right? But then 1980s, you had Ronald Reagan. Don't want to blame him completely. But he believed in less government. But he also believed in we need to take on the communists, right? And, and we need to spend an uh, enormous amount of money, especially on nuclear weapons, to deter the Soviet Union. We won the Cold War, we did, without a lot of violence, right? We defeated the Soviet Union. Basically, we outspend them. So in one respect, Ronald Reagan's approach was, it worked, but it ran up our national debt, right? And then of course, we started paying it down, our economy started going, uh, going down. Really, in modern history, 
Bill Clinton was one of the few people to really cut the military budget, cut other budgets, and and pay down the debt, right? Uh, but the 9-11 happened, and we're like, we got to invade Afghanistan, we got to invade Iraq, and then, you know, all this stuff, right? And then the Great Recession happened, and, 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 and by the 1980s, taxes became very unpopular, rather than this idea that, hey, you need to pay taxes because you love your country, right? And you love your neighbors, and you love Americans, right? It really became like, no, 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 taxes are just evil, 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 right? And, and that, that's become a mantra, the problem is that our national debt keeps going up and up and up. And, and we really um, are very fearful that we're no longer the only manufacturing game in town. So we're not going to be able to pay down this national debt like we did after World War II. Those circumstances are not the same, right? And so if we're going to take a chunk out of our national debt, you and I are going to have to make some sacrifices. It means that we have to cut welfare. But what about the poor? I understand. We have to make sure that they're working, right? We got to get people to work, right? We have to make sure that everyone's being responsible. It means that we have to tax the rich. We have to tax the middle class like me, right? Um, it means that we have to make tough choices. We have to make some sacrifices, right? And, and we're the marshmallow kid. We don't want to make any sacrifice. We want we want the marshmallow now. Oh, wait, but I can have another marshmallow in the future? Who cares? I just want my, you know, I want lower taxes now, but I also want, you know, more spending on the military. We can't blame any one party. Statistically speaking, when it comes to cutting taxes and raising spending, Democrats, Republicans are both to blame. Right. Democrats uh, typically like to raise taxes more than Republicans. Right. But but Democrats often run on, hey, you know, we're going to keep your taxes the same or we can tax. We can lower the taxes for the middle class. Democrats love to say that. Right. But Democrats like to spend a little bit more. But Republicans love to spend on criminal justice and on national security. Right. And military. Really, both both parties. Um, get elected by saying to their to their base, their voting base, I'm not going to raise taxes on you and I'm going to support and spend money on the things you care about. That's basically how both parties get elected. You and I have to start electing people to say, we need people that are fiscally responsible. If that means raising my taxes a little bit, I understand that. But we also need to cut spending. And we have to make sure that people are working, right? Your book talks about the five stages of the policy process. One is we need to figure out what, what needs to be done. And that's a big debate. That's a big debate. Um, some people will say Iran or North Korea or the, the military. Or some people will say no health care, right? Typically, because of the media, I don't want to blame the media too much, but we talked about this. If it bleeds, it leads. And so what gets a lot of attention is the COVID-19, terrorism, crime, shootings, war, right? And so generally, those tend to be very high profile. And when uh, a politician wants to identify things that are popular to say, I'm going to spend more on it, I'm going to spend more money uh, locking people up. Democrats did that in the 1990s. Bill Clinton, Joe Biden, we're going to spend more money to lock people up, put police on the street, right? We're going to spend more money to protect you from those crazy terrorists. We're going to spend more money to take on these crazy regimes like North Korea or Iran, right? Those are very popular, right? And we spend a lot of money on those things, even though the threat from Iran, the threat from North Korea, the threat from violent crime might be far less than we actually imagine it is. Clearly, we care about economic policy. We care about the stock market, which not maybe not all of us care about the stock market. We care about unemployment. We care about inflation. And, and so when someone says, I'm going to get you back to work, right? We're going we're gonna to send you a check for $2,400 and we're going to do this and this. Those are popular, popular priorities, but it means that we're going to spend more money. It's going to add to our national debt, which is already really high. Um, and of course, 
Um, I think Sarah Palin, they talk about this in the very first page, right? She's like, drill, baby, drill. You know, I, I don't like those slogans like three strikes, you're out or drill, baby, drill. They, they go to our gut rather than our critical thinking analysis, right? And drill, baby, drill, basically, uh, well, gas prices are pretty low now, but, but everyone cares about gas prices usually. And so the idea of drill, baby, drill tends to be very popular in that it could lower gas prices and it could create jobs, right? So people are like, yeah, drill, baby, drill. It's like, well, okay, if we look at economic policy, drill, baby, drill, um, you know, it, may, it maybe has some, some redeeming um, qualities, but it, it's far more complicated than that. Um, and we also, I think with, with all this focus on drill, baby, drill, or terrorism and crime or COVID-19, we do forget about mental illness and mental health and environmental pollution, water quality, Flint, the Flint, Michigan crisis with lead in the water. We forget about things that don't get as much attention. And that's why I, I showed you that, that video about mental health in England, right? Not the United States, but in England. So that we can start to think about that in a really big, complicated nation like we live in, we have to think about a lot of different things. We need to think about crime, right? We need to think about terrorism. We need to think about national security. We need to think about gas prices. We also need to think about mental health. We need to think about how air and water pollution um, leads to health problems, um, right? We, 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 need, we need to look at these things, right? When we start to look at the policy agenda, we start to define and frame problems in a certain way, right? For a very long time, I wrote my dissertation about crime policy a long time ago, people were just obsessed with crime. And, and not surprising given that from the late 1960s up until 1991, Crime kept going up and up and up and up and up. And people were like, what is going on? The problem is, because of the media and politicians, even when crime started going down after 19, 1991 and still going down, we were just still obsessed with locking people up for nonviolent offenses. Even though, right, you're very unlikely to be uh, killed by uh, violent crime. Now you may know someone who's been a victim of a violent crime. So I don't want to make, I don't want to belittle that. But statistically speaking, it tends to be a, a much um, rarer event. It's not even the top 10 causes of, of premature death, right? Heart disease, I mean, eating right, eating less fast food is gonna keep you safer than just putting more cops on the street, right? And really in the top 10 above homicide is suicide, right? We have a lot of guns in this in this uh, in this country. We have a lot of these guns because we're so afraid that we're going to be murdered in our home. But with but actually having access to guns, the statistics just do not lie on this case. Having a gun in in, in the house actually makes you more likely to die a violent death. Right? It, it's ironic. Now, owning a gun makes you feel safer, and and that's important too. To feel safe is important for quality of life. But statistically speaking, having a gun increases the likelihood of being a victim of violent crime. You may use it on, a, on yourself. You may use it on a significant other, right, that you live with, right? But we, we, we buy these guns because we're so afraid of this, uh, you know, this external enemy out there that's waiting for us to murder us, right? And that does happen. But statistically speaking, right, if you're going to be killed by someone, who's it going to be? It's going to be someone you know. It's going to be it's going to be a friend, a family member, a lover, ex-lover, what have you, right? Uh, but we imagine that it's going to be this, you know, dark stranger that's going to come in because you know whatever, right? Um, and so we need to analyze these problems, right, carefully because our imagination about Iran taking over the world or North Korea or whatever, um, it 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 we start to focus and, and exaggerate certain threats. So we need to define these problems carefully, right? And here's some more data about uh, causes of death. And again, homicide's up there, but it's, it's below Parkinson's disease, it's uh, below drug orders, it's below road accidents. Hex, just stop texting and driving and you're gonna be safer. 
eat less health, uh, eat more healthy, eat less fast food, stop fucking, oh, excuse my language, stop fucking texting while driving. And that's going to, that's going to be safer than just buying a gun to protect you from homicides, right? Especially when you're, if you're going to be, if you're going to be killed in a homicide, it's going to be someone that you know who might use your own gun on you, right? All right, sorry about that. Um, so we identify the problems that we need to address. Now we have to formulate solutions. This is not easy, right? We need to engage in analysis, right? We need to realize current needs versus future costs, trade-offs, um, you know, making everyone stay home and wear a mask makes us safer from the COVID-19 uh, virus, but it feels oppressive. It feels like our liberty is uh, being taken away, right? If we had a police officer on every corner, we would be safer, but it also, right, uh, you know, we start living in a police state, right? And so our liberty starts to decline. So there's always a trade-off, right, when we're trying to solve a problem, right? The trade-off might be worth it. What we find and what your book talks about is that typically our policies remain the same year to year and they only change incrementally uh, because of this no notion of path dependency. So uh, we're going to spend the same amount on the military year to year. We're going to spend the same amount of money on pandemics year to year unless there's a policy window. Right now, because it's a focusing event, COVID-19, there's a policy window to maybe change policy when it comes to health policy, when it comes to research and development, when it comes to vaccines, right, regarding pandemic. Just as in 1969, the Cuyahoga Co 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 River fire, right, in Ohio, that created a focusing event and a policy window where we could say, you know what, we actually need some policies to regulate um, environmental standards, right? Generally, we have a status quo bias where we don't want to do anything. We don't want to raise taxes. We don't want to divert spending. But when there's a new crisis or a policy window, we will change policy. It's not easy, but we do, and we have the capacity to respond to new threats, like spending enormous amount of money during World War II to defeat Nazi Germany. We, we were able to do that. And you had Americans buying treasury bonds, right? And there were shortages of goods and we just sucked it up because we needed to win that war. We sacrificed, right? People just volunteered, right? To, to join the military for very little pay, um, uh, to, to, to fight that, right? So every now and then there's a policy window where we're willing to make sacrifices and do what's necessary to address the problem. Whether it's a river catching fire and we realize, wait, 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 wait. That, I didn't know the water quality was that bad, right? That's a problem, right? Then we start to say, okay, all right, we, 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 I'm willing to pay more money in order to protect the environment. And here, here goes to the notion of if you want to be safer, you're going to infringe on certain liberties. And, and maybe that's you're willing to trade that off. Maybe you want a police officer in every state, uh, on, every, on every corner. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I, I think people should be required to uh, wear masks, right? I mean, stores have like no shirt, no shoes, no service. Hell, go barefoot. Uh, Go without a shirt, but fucking wear a mask, right? It's like, I'd rather have the store have that policy, right? And again, you know, when it comes to liberty, a private store like um, Target or Costco, that's private property. So if they want to say, hey, you can't come in without shoes or if you don't have a shirt, you, you need to dress appropriately. Um, they have that right to do that, right? Uh, and so if they want to ask for a mask, right? then they have that right to do that as well. The question is, if you're outside on a public street walking, can the government, like some countries have, 
require you to mask, wear a mask at all times. So I wear a mask when I go to the store. I don't go when I go for a walk outside. My wife does, and she's really irritated that I don't do it, right? Um, but I've read that when it comes to outside, if you keep your distance, the probability of getting it is uh, fairly, fairly limited. Although, again, data always changes, and, and our understanding of COVID-19 is limited. Um, but, but again, these policies make you safer, right, but infringe on your liberty. We can have more efficient, we can stress more efficiency, but it could mean that there's a threat to equality of treatment of people, right? Making sure that everyone's treated fairly is not very efficient, right? But it means that we're going to make sure that we treat everyone the same way. Let's say you have a great idea. You identify the problem. You came up with a great idea, right, to solve it. Now you got to Im implement it. The problem is that the world and the government and policy making is more complicated than we think, and implementing a good idea is easier said than done. Here's not a great example. The first one that popped in my mind, the Republicans in the 1990s, they gave through congressional action, they gave Bill Clinton, a Democratic president, the line item veto because Republicans at that time were very concerned about the national debt um, and they wanted they wanted to cut the debt. Right. And they wanted to give the president, Bill Clinton and future presidents, the line item veto where the president could get the budget from Congress. And instead of sending it back, if he didn't like it, he or she could delete certain things, right? And then sign sign the budget and it becomes law, right? And that would be a way where members of Congress who have certain constituencies and certain pork barrel um, uh, pork barrel projects back home, like there's a story about uh, a congressperson that got a bridge to nowhere funded, right? So we allow the president to cut those wasteful spending that could save money. And it was a great idea by Republicans. It really was, right? But one of the things that was cut was going to benefit New York City. And New York City sued and said, you can't give the president the line item veto because it's Congress that makes the budget, right? And there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that allows for a line item veto. And the US Supreme Court agreed with New York City. And that great idea, that great tool to save money was cut. You know what we could do? We could change our constitution to give the president that power, right? But again, you and I are obsessed with COVID-19 right now, as we should be. And we're obsessed with Iran and North Korea and, uh, and being murdered. We're afraid of that. We're, we're not going to bed and saying, God, I wish the president had the line item veto, right? We're distracted by other things. If it bleeds, it leads, and the line item veto doesn't bleed. But it's very important. I think this would be a very good tool. Republicans had this great idea, uh, but that darn Supreme Court said, yes, it's a great idea, but you got to amend the Constitution to do this. And we can, but we never did, right? And we realize with our federalist system that we have decentralized implementation of policy. And so the coronavirus, California, Nevada, New York, and Georgia, and Montana, they've all dealt with this somewhat differently, right? So you might have a great idea, but it's not necessarily going to be implemented in the same way in the 50 states, right? The, the federal government said you should open up after you've seen 14 days of declining um, declining COVID cases, right? And states didn't wait for that. Part of it is that measuring the number of cases is hard because we had very limited testing early on, and then we start to increase testing. And so part of the rise in cases is partly because we are exposing ourselves to danger, but also because we're testing more. So 
is not easy. And so these states are going to respond differently as we've seen in the COVID crisis. What we need to do is, even if it's a great idea, once you implement it, we have to evaluate it, right? And I think what we found, and you have, you have bipartisan support, Donald Trump, Kim Kardashian, you have all this, you know, all this bipartisan support. Republicans and Democrats all agree, uh, uh, not all, but almost all, a majority of Republicans and, and Democrats agree that the war on drugs and, and from the 1990s for, for two or three decades, just locking lots and lots of people up, mostly nonviolent offenders, just was not a good idea. Right. And even policies that sounded good. Three strikes, you're out. You've committed three, three crimes. We've given you three chances. Now you're going to serve 25 years to life. The problem is that we applied that in California. They applied it to someone who had three shoplifting uh, crimes. And their third strike was they, they stole a few hundred dollars. Was it golf clubs? Golf club equipment? It was a few hundred dollars worth of golf club equipment. And they were sentenced to 25 years to life, even though none of their crimes in their past were violent. In Texas, someone stole a slice of pizza from a kid, which is obviously a jerky thing to do, right? He was sentenced to 25 years to life. These cases actually went to the U.S. Supreme Court as cruel and unusual, and the Supreme Court said no, right? Steal a slice of pizza, you get 25 years, that's fine. And so we... We, we need to evaluate these things. But even though Donald Trump and Kim Kardashian and, and lots of Democrats believe that having locked up lots of, of nonviolent cr criminals was a horrible idea, our criminal justice system is not changing very rapidly, right? The police and our criminal justice are operating under very similar state laws that haven't been changed for the last three decades, except for, thank goodness, I think, legalization of marijuana. So if you have a little bit of marijuana, right, you you may not be charged the same way as you were 5, 10, 20 years ago, right? So that that's a good thing. But that that's just one that's one step, right? That's one step. We've criminalized so many types of activity that we it's going to take years and years even with bipartisan support to stop locking up non-violent offenders for for long periods of time. It takes a very long time. Even though everyone knows that the war on drugs and this war on crime uh, was not very effective. And some people would argue a failure. It takes a very long time to shift the criminal justice behavior in a different way. That's why we need to evaluate. It took, it took a very long time for people to finally realize, oh, wait, wait, locking up criminals um, is a bad idea? But don't we all hate criminals? We do all hate criminals, but we hate violent offenders far more than someone who has a small amount of drugs or someone who jaywalks or someone who um, engages in vandalism, right? Um, and so all those crimes, right, all those nonviolent crimes that we're punishing very harshly for the last few decades has really cost a lot of money. Good decision making requires some rationality. And your book talks about rational choice theory, it talks about it in this chapter and then an early chapter in your book, right? And um, being individually rational makes sense. You should look out for yourself. You should focus on what benefits you and your family. But in some cases, collect uh, individual rationality, things that make you immediately better off can create collectively irrational outcomes. For example, there's a long history and analysis of waste disposal. And from ancient, you know, medieval times up, up until colonial times, our early American history, the way that we disposed of waste, even your personal waste, like fecal matter, we just dumped it out, out the window, out on the street, right? Because if you don't have indoor plumbing, what's the easiest thing for you to do if you take you relieve yourself in a bucket to go walk that, that, that waste a mile away into a designated area or just throw it out your window, right? And so individually throwing out your waste out the window makes you immediately in the short run better off. It makes the community and you in the long run 
right, worse off. So this notion of individual rationality makes sense. You should care about yourself. You should do things that maximize your self-interest. The problem is it can lead to collective irrational outcomes. And that's where government comes in. Government says, all right, all right, all right. We need to invest in plumbing and waste disposal and trash collection. And, 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 and we're going we're gonna to tax everyone for that, right? And that's where government comes in to solve some of those collectively irrational outcomes. You want to maximize your self-interest, but do you know what your self-interests are? Often what we find, like that marshmallow video, is you maximize your short-term benefits, which can harm your long-term goals, right? Which is why government has policies like Social Security to help you when you get older, because most people don't save enough. Or have incentives like Roth IRAs, individual retirement accounts, that create tax savings, tax incentives for you to save more. And health, health savings accounts and all these different things, right? Because the government's trying to encourage you to save for the future, even though you're like, but I don't want to save for the future. I might be dead in the future. I want my marshmallow now. I want my brand new car, right? That I can't afford, but it looks really cool. And I'm going to get a really cool boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Because I have a really cool car. You and I don't always know what's best for ourselves. I know that sounds a little bit um, patriarchal, right? It's like, you don't know what's best for you. But, but we don't. We've all made mistakes. We've all sort of been short-sighted, right? And we have biases. That's why I like that video that I'm making you watch in this module, why you think you're right even when you're wrong, right? And I always keep that in mind because I know that I can be wrong. And it's going to be hard for me to know that I'm wrong because we always think that we're right, right? So yeah, make sure you watch that little. It's, it's such a cute video, such a cute. And of course, the, the researchers have shown that the kids that are able to forego the immediate gratification and think about long-term benefits, right? The second marshmallow, doubling your rewards, right? When you follow these kids, right? They do better in the future, right? They get better grades, right? They get better jobs, right? The skill of foregoing immediate gratification and looking to the future is a advantageous strategy. You do better right? Which is why I think we need to say, you know what? We sometimes need to cut spending on my favorite, you know, on my favorite projects, whether it's the military or national parks or welfare, or food stamps. And we sometimes need to raise taxes, right? We need, we need to look to the future. Right? And this idea of rationality and rational choice theory is that We want to be rational. We want to make good decisions. We often have limited information, which means we need, we need to go look for that information. We have competing self-interests, right? We want to be safe, but we want to be free, right? We want more liberty, but we also want more security. So which one do we want more, right? We want lower taxes, but we also want the government to be able to respond to crises, right? We, as the, as the marshmallow video shows, we prefer short-term benefits to long-term benefits. And if we, if we could teach a class on public policy, and I've taught, I've taught public policy for years, we know that some costs, right, are hidden, right? And so you can go to Walmart and buy t-shirts for remarkably great price. And part of that is the amazing aspect of capitalism and how businesses just try to be as efficient as possible financially. And what businesses have found is that they can grow cotton. Uh, we actually have really good farmers here, very efficient farmers, and they grow cotton very well here. And we can then ship that cotton uh, thousands and thousands of miles away. We can, we can pack it up, drive it, drive, put on a truck, uh, drive it to a port, unload it from a truck, load it onto a ship, have the ship sail to Bangladesh, a port in Bangladesh, unload the ship, put it on a truck, load, uh, unload the truck onto a, a, a textile factory in Bangladesh. And because the wages are 50 cents a day um, in, in, some, in some countries, um, we can pay those workers to make the T-shirts, 
pack them up, put them on a truck, drive the truck to the Bangladesh port, unload the truck, load the <laughs> load the ship, set sail back to the United States, unload the ship, put it on the truck, and then drive that truck to Walmart. And still buy that T-shirt for five bucks, right, or ten bucks, you know, whatever. Depending on what sale you have at Kohl's, I like Kohl's. Um, but environmentally, that is far from efficient, right? And and so some of the costs are hidden, hard to measure. And here's a great little video of someone who was in the T-shirt manufacturing, who's who who is criticizing free trade as an academic. My readings of free trade suggest that free trade is very, very beneficial overall on average, year to year for for most countries. Well, actually, economists would say for all countries. But I've never owned a business, and this person has clearly suffered from free trade. Um, and, and it's an interesting perspective if you want to take a look at another little TED Talk um, done at Elon University. I think he makes some very good arguments and some very good points. I'm still, I'm, I'm still pro-free trade as an academic. But again, if I was a business owner, I might have a different point of view. I know. A long, long, boring video. I'm almost done. In the end, right? We all we are all rational, self-interested individuals trying to solve problems the best we can. But it needs good information, right? It means looking beyond just the first blog that you uh, find on the internet or the first video uh, you find on uh, on YouTube, right? Um, it, it's it's looking at real analysis, right? Uh, it, it's it's easier to watch a 15 minute uh, video on YouTube that tells you that you know there's some conspiracy going on. What what's the popular one going on? Plandemic, right? <laughs> um, and and you you can create you can create a video in such a way that it can almost convince anyone. There's a great documentary behind Citizens United uh, called Hillary the Movie. If you watch it, oh my God, oh man. Phew, it's hard not to despise Hillary Clinton after watching that movie. We are emotional animals, right? We're emotional animals. And you can design a video in such a way that it can sort of start to convince people of lots of different things. But just because you feel convinced doesn't mean that you actually have access to good information. Really good information, which you'll learn in, in higher level courses, is really published peer-reviewed academic research. And not just one article, right? Because one article, what, what, what we learn in, in a scientific methodology is that one study is meaningless. One study is meaningless, even if it's published in the best academic journal in the world. The question is, can you replicate it? Are you having other studies that are finding similar answers, right? In other peer-reviewed academic journal articles, right? You got to get the good information. And that's, that's, going beyond blogs or YouTube, okay? It requires getting good data and engaging in some analysis, which requires some training, which is why you have data experts and data analysts and you have certain subfield experts, right? And a president needs those types of analysts to advise them because no matter how smart a president is, can't be an expert on monetary policy and pandemic policy, right? We need careful analysis. We need critical thinking, right? We need critical thinking, right? So that when someone says, well, this, this, this COVID-19 might just disappear. Well, it, it might, it might, right? We've had uh, scary viruses come and scare the heck out of us and they weren't as resilient as we thought and they did disappear. It does happen, right? But that shouldn't be like, that shouldn't be plan A. Let's just hope for that, right? We, we realize that, most viruses do stick around, whether it's a common cold or whether it's a flu or whether what have you. We need to engage in critical thinking, right? And I think college helps us, right, in, in critical thinking. To be skeptical, right? I think you need to learn to be, if something sounds really good, like, oh, there's this new anti-malaria drug um, and it's a game changer. Like, oh, that sounds really great. 
but let's be a little bit uh, skeptical and say, well, okay, I know I want to believe that because of, you know, this person said it and I like them and it makes me feel good because we have a game changing drug. Like, well, okay, we probably need to look a little bit closer to that, right? If something makes you feel really good, some type of news, you should probably be say, all right, I probably have to look at this a second time. If something immediately makes you say, that's wrong, that's wrong, oh, that has to be wrong, you probably need to be a little bit more open-minded. And that's the trick. Trying to be open-minded to things that your brain immediately says, that's a stupid idea, right? Because that's your bias talking. Whenever you're saying immediately without a lot of information, that's a stupid idea. That's your bias talking. Whenever you say, that sounds like a brilliant idea, right? That's your bias talking, right? And so you, you kind of have to, you have to be open-minded to things that kind of scare you and you have to be sort of critical and skeptical of things that sort of make you feel too, uh, too good. Early in, in the COVID-19, there was one study that came out of China. It said people with O positive blood were more resilient. And I was like, yes, I like that. I like that study. That's a good study, right? Because I'm O positive blood. Um, but, I, but I mean, like, I'm like, all right, all right, you know. At first, it wasn't published yet. It hadn't been, it hadn't gone through the published peer review process. And eventually, other researchers couldn't replicate it. And so, you know, it, it hypothetically still could be true, but the data suggests that it's not, it's not, right? Yeah, you have to you have to engage in critical thinking, which is hard. It is hard, harder than you think, right? All right. Sorry for the long video. Public policy, along with public opinion, is is one of my favorite topics, and I could go on and on about that. It's been a pleasure and actually an honor to teach you, right? Um, I hope you got something out of this class. And feel free to contact me anytime after the semester if you need, you know, anything. Until next time.